And once again, Lord, we thank you for this morning and your mercy that are new upon us. We thank you for the gift of your word. Lord, we want to just echo in our hearts what the psalmist says. Lord, teach us uh, to praise you from our inmost beings, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we'll do Psalm 104 today. It's quite a long psalm, so I may be racing slightly. It's a psalm of praise, and if you look at verse 1, which is like an introduction to the psalm, it says, Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. And we might see that verse 1 as the introduction to this psalm of praise, and it reminds us, of course, of Psalm 103, where which also starts the same way. So people wonder whether it is a Psalm of David because he wrote Psalm 103, but we don't know for sure. So we won't bother about that. So it starts with an exhortation to self. Again, to praise. And that word again is Barak. It is to bless, to bow down in adoration. And the rest of the Psalm is, of course, the reason why we are to bow down in adoration to Yahweh. In Psalm 103, uh, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget, forget not all his benefits. It was about God's blessings upon him. But here it's completely different. It's outward. It says that, Bless the Lord, O my soul, for his greatness, his splendor, his majesty, as seen in creation. And in fact, when we look at the psalm, the pattern of the psalm loosely follows the first five days of creation. Yeah, well, the sixth day is implied throughout, and we'll see that a bit later. Possibly even the seventh day is implied, but we see a pattern of the first five days. And, you know, as we look at this psalm, it struck me that it's a good example of a poetic description of creation. Yeah, as we go through the psalm, you will see how he takes poetic license, he's being artistic. It actually reminded me of uh, Supriya painting something as we worship or whatever. You know, it will be something that is depicting, it's poetic, it's artistic, it's extravagant, it's not, it's figurative, it's not meant to be literal. And as I read that and said, yeah, this is a poetic description of creation, which Genesis 1 is not. Genesis 1 is narrative. It's the actual process of creation. It's not meant to be, it's not lyrical, it's not poetic, it's not fanciful, like this one is. You know, so he's looking at the narrative of Genesis 1. And the, the sad thing is that Genesis 1 is said to be poetic and lyrical and all that, and it is not. It's just straightforward narrative. That's what God did. That's when he did it. That's how he did it. And Psalm 104 is an example of what is actually poetic, somebody looks at that narrative and then is inspired uh, to, to create something artistic, which is what Psalm 104 would be. So that's just an aside, you know, my bugbear of Genesis chapter 1 is, is literal six-day creation. Okay, so there's a little bit of ebb and flow in this, a little bit of, uh, I guess, uh, mix, mixture, but loosely it's a five days. So we'll, we'll go day by day. Day one is verses two to five. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations, it can never be moved. That is the sort of depiction of day one. Genesis 1 verses 1 to 5 is the story of day one of creation, where God creates light and then he makes day and night, or designates day and night, shall we say. And what the psalmist says is, of course, he's thinking of God as the great and awesome king, and he says, what more glorious clothing can anyone have then light itself. And so that picture of God wrapping himself with light as with a garment. 
and I thought, again, as we were singing, I thought uh, the earth was covered with water, we'll see. And then later on, it's covered with so much beauty. We are covered with grace and God is covered with light itself. There can't be anything more glorious than light itself. Okay. And then the imagery of God constructing the earth, so starting that construction like a tent, like a building. You know, there may be there may be notions of the stretching of the heavens, and we know from science actually that the heavens are to this day being stretched, expanding. But there's no reason to assume that that's what he's talking about. He's talking about just how a, how a tent is stretched, how a building is built with beams. So he's just using that imagery of God starting his work of construction. You know, I mean, I guess in construction, the beams and all are the framework, shall we say, of what he, of what, of, of a building. And so that construction work begins. He speaks of the clouds being his chariot. And I thought to myself that he's being, he's being poetic here. But there were ancient religions that took this literally, took, took things like this literally. Like, for example, they thought of the, the sun as the chariot and God went from one side, his chariot went from one side to the other and then rested. And, you know, they were all kind, they actually thought it was happening. The psalmist doesn't think it's happening. He's just using, using this, the glorious things he sees in creation to talk about how awesome God is. Okay. But in this particular case, he makes the clouds his chariot. Well, actually the clouds were often seen as vehicles of God's presence. You know, in Exodus, every time God came, he came in a cloud. He came on Mount Sinai in a cloud. He would come on the tabernacle in a cloud. The pillar of cloud was the presence of God guiding them. In fact, even the pillar of fire was not actually fire. It was fire in the cloud. It was light in the cloud that was doing the guiding. And so that sense of 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 clouds being the vehicle of God's presence. So that may be what he's, uh, he rides on the wings of the wind, this whole, this, this whole picture. But verse 4 is actually extremely interesting, where it says he makes winds his messengers. And if you see the footnote, it says, or angels. He makes angels his messengers. Hebrews 1 verse 7 says that this verse is about angels and not about the wind. Okay, if you look at Hebrews 1 verse 7, which quotes this verse, it says, He makes angels, winds, his servants, flames of fire. And so the picture of the angels as fiery messengers, so to speak. And this seems to be evidence that the angels were created on day one of creation. Because we know they were created somewhere in the first three days. Because they were present when God created the sun, moon and stars, according to Proverbs. And so we know somewhere in the first three days. And not before that, because the Bible says uh, uh, in the Ten Commandments, everything was created in those six days. So the angels would have had to come in those six days. They were definitely there on day four when the sun, moon and stars were created. This may indicate that they were there on day one itself. Okay, though we are not told when they exactly they were created. Okay. The bottom line is verse five. He set the earth on its foundation that can never be moved. Bottom line is the stability and permanence of what God established. The caveat here would be until he decides to do something about it. And we know that that the earth and the heaven are going to be destroyed and a new heaven and new earth are going to come. But at God's will, not because man does something. No, even though man is doing a lot of things, the devil is doing a lot of things. But the permanence of the earth, the stability are in God's hands until he chooses otherwise. And I, I want to take each of these days and each of these uh, poetic descriptions and I want to end with something that will apply to us. Okay, What God has established is permanent, is stable, and we can, in a sense, take it to the bank for our lives when he's up to something, is establishing something in our lives. It is in his hands. It's established, it is firm, it is stable because it is in his hands and he has established it. So that's day one. Day two, verses six to nine. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. But at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. 
They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. Genesis 1 verses 6 to 8 is the story of day 2 where all that God does is the separation of the waters above and below and he calls the waters above sky. Now the language of this could also relate to day 3 where he tells the sea to find its place. But if the pattern is followed then it can also re refer to day 2. We see the state of the earth at the end of the second day. It was closed in water, completely covered with water. Okay. And then the separation took place at the sound of his voice. So this is most likely speaking of the separation above and below. The waters fled or they went to their place above and their place below. Okay. The separation took place at the sound of his voice. And I thought to myself, why rebuke? Such a strong word. I mean, the water didn't do anything wrong. Okay? Of course, apart from the psalmist being uh, taking poetic license, that word rebuke is also giving us a sense of its authority and power over. And actually that word rebuke also referred to conquering or conquest over the waters that they had to. And you can imagine if you think of the seas, all of the water that exists today on the earth and we don't see most of it, what power it has. The psalmist wants to make the point that at just the rebuke of his voice, at just his voice, the waters had to go and then a whole, a whole lot of the water went up and formed the firmament and the rest of the water was still down on the earth. The waters were separated. They found their boundary, so to speak. There was a boundary above and below. Okay. And he says in verse 9 that the boundary is permanent. In fact, even the time of Noah's flood, it was not fully crossed because all the water from above did not come down. There is obviously some water still up in the atmosphere. Okay. And so that boundary was never fully crossed. Never again will they cover the earth, which is obviously a reference to Noah's flood. Because waters did come down and did cover the flood once after creation. After the six days of creation. So just want to give us a principle for our lives that God is the establisher of boundaries. Not just physical, but also moral. Now that is so important in this world of relative morality and relative truth that God has set boundaries. Okay. He has set boundaries for behavior. He has set boundaries for relationships. He has set boundaries for sexuality. He has set boundaries and they cannot be broken or they are broken at our peril. And today really we see boundaries being broken. We do so at our peril, at the peril of our societies and nations. So that's day two. Day 3 verses 10 to 18. It's quite long. I'll just read it through. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the air nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests, the stalk has its home in the pine trees. The high mountains belong to the wild goats, the crags are a refuge for the conies. Now Genesis 1 verses 9 to 13 tells us the story of day 3 where God separates the land and the sea. So dry land appears for the first time. The sea finds its place and vegetation appears. So the basic contours of land and sea and vegetation. And now you might say here, but he, he talks about a whole lot of birds and animals and all of that. 
but he is doing that in the context of what God has made on day three for them. That's the context of this thing. Okay, we see the water mentioned five times in springs and streams and rivers, and just the notion of irrigation because man is cultivating. And so we see we see that water from being that which covers the earth in verse two in day on day two is something useful in day three. For what God wants to establish on the earth, on dry land. Okay, and what what we see in this passage is, and you can see that if you look at it closely, is that the land and the sea are ordered to provide for the birds and for the animals and for mankind, food and water as well as homes. So that's what's happening here. The dry land is being described. Not just with what's happening with with water sources, but you know, where people where the high mountains are for the wild goats, the crags are for the conies, the the trees and the branches are for the nests. All of this came on day three. God was preparing for what was to come on in the other days. He was ordering the land, the vegetation, the plants, the grass, all of that. Even the the vineyards that were coming up. Were for wine that would gladden the heart of man, and so on and so forth. Um, Kaufman writes this nice line. I thought I'm not going to read it out. This psalm indicates that same perfect adaptation and adequacy of the earth, not merely for mankind but for all of the creatures God made and placed upon it. That perfect adaptation and adequacy. God was ordering all things. what can we learn from this for ourselves i just looked looked at verse 15 i want to take it for ourselves right wine wine that gladdens the heart of man oil to make his face shine and bread that sustains his heart he god has created the world to gladden our hearts to make our faces shine which is actually another picture of rejoicing and to sustain or to strengthen our hearts day 4 Verses nineteen to twenty-three. The moon marks of the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness; it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises, and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labor, until evening. Day four. What did God create? Genesis one verses fourteen to nineteen. The sun, moon, and stars. basically the lights for the day and the lights for the night yeah and that's what's happening here he says that the sun and the moon carry out their daily as well as their seasonal functions okay so they they going on with what they're supposed to do but all of that is for life on the earth okay and then he talks about day and night he says what are day and night they're the environment for the animals and mankind So he makes that point there that the animals come out in the night and do their stuff, and man has the day to carry out his work. Okay, so the sun and the moon are carrying out their functions. Animals and man have the opportunity, the environment to carry out their functions. So again, he is not talking about animals and man as in creation so much so as the fact that on day four the sun, moon, and stars were created in order to serve. life on the earth okay and so you may say that he is a god of perfect timing both micro and macro whether it is day and night whether it is seasons and what we are what we are meant to do what we can do and you can of course expand on that for example man can do different things in different seasons and the same with animals no say a bear will go and hibernate for months on end the different seasons to do different things day and night to do different things he is the god of perfect timing then we go to day 5 which is verses 24 to 26 how many are your works o lord how in wisdom you made them all the earth is full of your creatures there is the sea vast and spacious teeming with creatures beyond number living things both large and small 
There the ships go to and fro and the Leviathan which you formed to frolic there. Now day 5 is seen in Genesis 1 verses 20 to 23 where God populates the sky and the sea with birds and fish. And so we see here a reference just to fish. But he starts with exclaiming at the wonder of the quantity and quality of God's creation. How many are your works? In wisdom you made them all. The quantity and the quality. And then he focuses on the sea. And of course on day 5 he forgets the birds here. But it's okay because he's just being poetic. He's not narrating something. But he just focuses on the the fact that the, the, the seas are full of sea creatures, teeming with creatures beyond number. And he mentions the sea creatures. Leviathan was most likely a sea monster. And that picture of the mighty Leviathan being given this environment where it can frolic or play. We see much more of Leviathan and Job, I think it's chapter 40 if I'm not mistaken, or 41. But the overall picture I saw from God, a God who delights in diversity. He's such a wonderfully creative God and he's just made all these, uh, the sea teeming with sea creatures, large and small. Okay, he delights in diversity. Then verses 27 to 30. I have, I feel that they are applied to all of creation because he mentioned five days, but all of the creation of sixth day he sort of mentioned throughout the psalm. Okay, though day six is not specifically addressed, animals and man are already mentioned several times. Let me let let us consider these verses for all of his creatures because they do apply. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the earth. So verse 27. No matter how big or small, all creatures are dependent on God for their food at the proper time. That word is enough at the right time. It echoes, I mean, I think Jesus echoes that in the, when he says, no, even the sparrow, I mean, I mean, God, what is it? It's in Matthew, Matthew 6, that Both God feeds, sparrow. you know, he God feeds the sparrows. They don't have to worry about their food. Okay. That kind of picture. Then verse 28, he gives generously. When you open your hand, they are satisfied. He gives generously and he gives what is good. But we also need to receive it. They gather it up. Okay, and I think so often we complain that God has not given, but we have not received. You know, we have not gathered what he is giving us. Maybe because we are looking for something else. But he opens his hand and gives us good things that will satisfy us. And just as life is in his hands, as seen in this provision, so is death. But in verse 30, he talks of this renewal of life of the earth, new births, cycles of seasons, are all the work of the same spirit who was there in creation, who did that work of creation, the spirit hovering over the waters, bringing creation about. He is the one who is involved continuously in the new things that also come to pass. And so this beautiful picture of life, of provision, of even death and of all of this, this cycle of life shall we say, of not just creatures, I think of the earth itself, you know, the seasons are a picture of that, of winter coming and then spring and summer and that sense of new life. Okay, For us, what can we take of it? We are renewed by the breath of the Spirit of God in a way that the psalmist would not even have conceived of. Because we have new birth, we are born again, we are being renewed by the transforming of our minds. All of this is the work of the Spirit. Because in this, though it says capital S, it need not be capital S here. It's quite likely the psalmist meant a small s. 
when you send your spirit when you send your breath you know but we know that we have a capital s spirit the holy spirit we are renewed by him and then in conclusion there's a sort of a doxology i guess the what the psalmist desires i just read it out may the glory of the lord endure forever may the lord rejoice in his works he who looks at the earth and it trembles who touches the mountains and they smoke i will sing to the lord all of my life i will sing praise to my god as long as i live may my meditation be pleasing to him as i rejoice in the lord but may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more praise the lord of my soul praise the lord the psalmist desires that god's glory which is so evident in creation which is what has inspired the psalm will endure forever and there's a hint here of genesis 131 when god says of his completed creation it is very good you know god looked at all of his creation after 6 days and he said it was very good he rested on the 7th day there's a hint of that as well um god was delighting in his creation and here it says no may the lord rejoice in his works okay then he looks at the earth it trembles he touches the mountains and they smoke is clearly an echo here of mount sinai of god being so awesome when he wants his awesome god i mean the glory was is seen in his creation his glory was seen on mount sinai and his desire that that glory endure forever in effect meaning that we will behold his glory forever because god will be glorious forever but it's a matter of on the earth the psalmist commitment to praise god always and i think with his gift you know i will sing to the lord the psalmist obviously obviously is a singer is a musician is an artist and i i thought that was so important actually that he said i will use my gift it actually comes up there i didn't say it earlier it was not so re- so evident but in, i said in day 3 that god created the the land the contours of the land the vegetation on the land for us i mean for creatures for food for water and also for homes but look at this verse In verse twelve, he says, "The birds of the air nest by the waters." Now that is a picture of the environment because the, near the waters, the trees grow better, so branches, the nesting, so the home for them. And it says, "They sing among the branches. They do what they were created to do. That's their gift to sing." And the psalmist says, "I will also do that. I will sing. I will use my gift to praise God, but also with his thoughts, my meditation." with his emotions i will rejoice in the lord hmm? as opposed to sinners and the wicked who are not doing that and so he says i want god your glory to endure forever but not the sinners and the wicked and he ends as he began praise the lord o my soul praise the lord and that can be our application as well to say to ourselves for oh, there's awesome creation it's amazing we actually can see creation even more beautifully than the psalmist could for example of the hubble telescope we can see things that he could never conceive of we can see into the atoms of uh things and see how awesome those things are we have so much more exposure to what is in creation through youtube for example all those videos they show us of how animals behave and the beauty of creation we don't have to go there to see it okay we should say far more than the psalmist praise the lord o my soul i'm looking forward to some really creative artistic ways of expressing how amazing creation is from all the artists on in highway okay lord give us a fresh appreciation of your creation the beauty of your creation of the wonder of it of uh, your delight in it lord may we delight as you do uh, may we cherish it as you do may we learn from it lord all that you want us to we want to say as the psalmist bless the lord for my soul truly you are very great awesome in your splendor and majesty we thank you lord for this creation that you've gifted to us in jesus name amen